Good afternoon. My name is Joe Litovsky. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Debating Europe, which is the citizen outreach and engagement team here at Friends of Europe. Uh, welcome to this policy insight on citizens as shareholders of the European project, what's next? And that what's next in the title of today's event is important. I think this is the question that we're all wondering. Remember the context of this discussion is that the Conference on the Future of Europe, the largest pan-European exercise in deliberative democracy has concluded earlier this month, uh, last month in fact, in May. And the question is, what's next? What happens now? Uh, how should deliberative democracy be integrated into the EU policymaking process going forwards? And what happens to the recommendations from the conference? Um, and in the spirit of today's topic, we want to give you in the audience as much space as possible for deliberation and, and participation. Uh, so please, I hope you're thinking up some, some questions and some comments for our, our panel of speakers today. First, I'm just going to go over some basic uh, ground rules, some, some housekeeping. Uh, I mean, we've all been through uh the 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 pandemic we we all kind of moved on to zoom you know the, the the basic rules of the game if you want to speak click on the little raise hand button at the bottom of the screen like that um and uh you can also write in the chat as well um i'll see that or one of my college colleagues will give me a virtual nudge and i'll give you the floor so you can ask your question um, make sure you're muted during the event so we don't have distracting background noise. Obviously, don't forget to unmute uh, if you have the floor um, and introduce yourself and the organization you represent when you speak, just so everyone knows who you are. If you're able to uh, kind of change your display name so it's got first name, surname, and then in parentheses, your organization, that keeps everything nice and clear. But also when you speak, you can tell everyone who you are. Uh, good, and that's it, really. Um, with the rules of the game out of the way, let's get on with the discussion. So let me introduce uh, our first speaker today, Alberto Alamano, who is Jean Monnet Professor in EU Law at HEC Paris, uh, founder of the Good Lobby and a friend of Europe 2014 European Young Leader. Alberto, welcome. Hello. Hello, Joe. Hello, everybody. Good to, good to see you all. It's good to see you, Alberto, too. Thank you for, for being here today. Um, I'm going to kick off. I mean, the, the question of the day really is what's next? Um, and so, we, OK, we've concluded the conference on the future of Europe. We have the recommendations from the citizens. Um, estimates vary pretty wildly. I've seen you know, some estimates saying 90% uh, of these recommendations will require treaty change. I've seen some saying 10%. I've seen some saying 50%. But certainly, some of the recommendations I think most people accept would could be done without treaty change, and some may require treaty change. Uh, we have had a non-paper distributed by various member states, particularly Scandinavian and, and Eastern member states, who are quite critical of the idea of, of treaty change. So there seems to be a question mark over, you know, what happens next. The question I have for you then is, is how how might some of these proposals, which often, you know, some of them are, are very far reaching, how can they be addressed and even implemented, you know, politically? Uh, what, what happens next is the, is the question, Alberto. Thank you, Joe, for, for asking me the key, the key $6 million question. Um, I've been incessantly been saying that it would be a mistake to measure the success of the Conference on the Future of Europe against its ability to trigger treaty change. And I'm gonna say this again, uh, I think the success of the conference should be measured by the quality and quantity of the recommendations that its randomly selected citizens um, have been able to formulate and let them spread within and across the domestic and the European political spaces. So the question to be asked is then how many of the conference on the future of Europe ideas are becoming contagious, are obliging political leaders to position themselves in relation to those very same recommendations and ideas. We all know that the conference hasn't been a major success story in terms of narrative, entailing millions of people participation. It didn't happen, but those ideas are already there. They are popping up in political programs at the national level. They are part of our daily conversation. That's what the leaders of the European Council are discussing right now. Those ideas have become part 
of our political conversation across Europe in a transnational way. All of this is pretty new, is pretty innovative, and very few people would have expected this to happen. Having said so, uh, let me address specifically your question with, with a bit more uh, precision and accuracy. I'm one of those who has spent time going uh, one recommendation after the other and trying to figure out how many of them would actually entail treaty change in order to become a reality. And my answer, together with my students, has been, well, approximately 21 out of 178 uh, recommendations would entail such a change. There are two categories. So these 21 recommendations can be split in two categories. One is about pushing for new or better European policies. It might be about establishing common health standards, common energy mix, common education curriculum. But there's a second category that is one that is probably drawing the attention of the Brussels bubble a bit more is what are the provision, what are the recommendations that require new rules of the game, uh, European wide referendum, changing the name of the European institutions, dropping the unanimity voting. Well, this second category probably is the less relevant one in terms of numbers, but these are big changes, right? And this is possibly what we would need to do if we want uh, to, to uh, uh, potentially go ahead. At the same time, as you already said, more than 90% of these recommendations don't require any treaty change. And there are two specific rules of the game we are currently discussing, which do not require treaty change at all. And one is the possibility of institutionalizing permanent citizens assembly. So making these citizens permanently advising the European institution. And the second one is the new electoral law. Uh, which has been pushed forward uh, by the European Parliament in parallel uh, to the uh, Conference on the Future of Europe, in which is also not requiring uh, a treaty change. So you can see that basically the two major takeaways of the Conference on the Future of Europe, on the one hand, the ability of citizens to provide advice to the institutions on a permanent basis, and the right to vote on a pan-European college are two ideas that are already dominating the political conversation. Virtually all institutions said they are in favor. Virtually all political leaders said we are in favor. We are going to do that uh, soon. Um, those do not require treaty change. So a final line, I don't feel much political appetite for reopening the treaties at the moment. I don't think that the European Parliament request, which is going to be formalized in June uh, by putting forward a set of amendments, will translate into the a convening of a, of a convention, even though only 14 member states are required out of 27 simple majority, should those do that if their proposed amendments would then require the unanimity, meaning all the other uh, countries to actually become a reality. So this is my prediction. I don't think, I don't think we're going to follow or witness the uh, convening of an Article 48 ordinary procedure revision. But there is the possibility that some revision might occur uh, in a more, let's say, tangential way, perhaps by following new procedures that might push forward some of these ideas, but in a very selective fashion. Rather, the offer by the institutions will probably be to follow up on many of those recommendations and do so outside of treaty changes by using more intergovernmental cooperation, as we've been assisting during the pandemic, joint procurement for medicines, and now we might be witnessing with the European response to the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, where we see a lot of joint action uh, really at the borderline of the treaty competencies, but still member states have a political will to act together. So that's my take. Okay, very interesting. So don't obsess about treaty change is the, <laughs> is the summary. Even having the ideas out there, even having the conversation and having the process um, be seen as, as legitimate is a step forward and it introduces you know it moves the conversation it changes the the window of, of what is possible so let's not get bogged down into the the, the the kind of discussion around treaty change and let's lo look at what can be done uh i think is, is is what you're saying very interesting okay let's hear from a citizen let's hear what what um uh valentina balzani who was a participant at the conference on the future of, of Europe? She was in panel two, uh, which is on which was on European democracy, values and rights, rule of law and security. And I think my colleague uh, Alessandra Cardacci, who's in the audience, was uh, facilitating on uh, some of the sessions on on that panel. Um, Valentina, welcome. Welcome. Hi. Nice to see you, and nice to see all the people following us. 
thank you for the invitation. <laughs> thank you for, for, for accepting. And, and um, you know, what I'm interested in is what, because I, I mean, we're talking about the conference, um, you know, and, and you were you were there, you were part of it. Uh, this is a kind of historical uh, kind of event. It's the biggest um, uh, pan-European uh, exercise of, of deliberative democracy. Uh, the, you know, similar, we'll hear from other uh, speakers in similar um, panels have been run at the national and at uh, local level, of course, but this was done at the, the European level, which was a, a, an innovation for EU politics. What was it like to be part of the conference, what were your what was your kind of experience of it? And maybe you could perhaps speak a little bit uh, to your you know your expectations, what you hope to see happen, um, and what you kind of think uh, might actually be the the, the reality of, of of what happens. Uh, but first of all, you know, tell us about the the conference and your experience. The experience, yeah. Well, the experience was actually exciting because uh, I mean it was unbelievable to all of us to be to be able to be enter the par European Parliament and uh, make our, our voices heard and say what we want to ask to European institutions. Because, uh, as you know, maybe we all complain about uh, national politics and European politics. They don't listen to the citizens. They don't listen to us and what we really want. They do not understand. And now we can do it. <laughs> I mean, with the conference, we could really do it. And uh, apart from the initial excitement uh, we were also afraid because we were common people we didn't know how politics worked and how to behave properly in that place so at the beginning there was a sort of positive disbelief i mean how can how can we do uh, something how can we give our uh, actual contribution to this process and uh, i mean the the first part of in the citizen panel i think it was a sort of introductory uh, instrument uh, to make us all I mean, know, know each other and know European institutions and start to know how the, the following work would be. Because uh, then when we started with the, our I mean, second role with, as ambassadors in the plenary, we were much used to, to the European Parliament and much self-confident, uh, I mean, to, uh, taking the, uh, the, to taking the floor to expressing our views and we started new uh, much better how to behave and how to uh, react to politicians' uh, questions or to politicians' uh, actions against our proposals because especially in the working groups uh, there were so there had been a lot of work to do uh, to keep uh, our position uh, saved into the proposals from the recommendation to proposals. And this is, was really, it was really a great experience in terms of, uh, you know, self-awareness of our words, our support as uh, citizens. And uh, I think, yes, it was an amazing experience for all of us, actually. It was a big effort because, you know, the planning was a little bit uh, easier at the very beginning with a meeting once a month and uh, because of the pandemic changed uh, a lot and became two meetings in a uh, month uh, from March to April so it was a really big work because we have uh, we had documents to read and to keep up with all uh, uh, addiction and changes and suggestions coming from uh, even different members of the conference plenary. And what is your can maybe what do you expect to happen now as a as a follow up? I mean, we heard from Alberto Alamano saying, you know, let's not get fixated on on treaty change. There are some, you know, the ideas are out there. Some of them are very likely to be adopted. Maybe some others. If for you, would it be a disappointment if not all of the the, the ideas are out there, or, or are you like okay, um, you know? It, being part of the conversation and being kind of being able to to kind of join the negotiation on the future yeah. of Europe that was important. What are your expectations for for what happens next? Well, the expectation is that of, uh, at least our uh, proposals that be listened and really taken into consideration. I'm personally not so concerned about treaty change, but I am concerned about uh, the institution may uh, catch actually the meaning of our request the underlying uh, approach that is uh, within all proposals. Because I think that this, as citizens, what the main uh, request we, we, put, uh, to, we put forward is that of being, uh, let's say, an, uh, equal treatment of uh, respect, of equality. And this is what we want to uh, be kept 
I mean, the actual realization of what we ask for is up to institution and we want to know it's why, how they can do it and why they do not do it in the way we ask, maybe. But I think that big fulfillment will be to have a, a request realized. Actually, okay. not so, actually with treaties changes. Yes. So this for you, um, it was as Alamano was was saying that it's the the having the voice of citizens represented, having it kind of at the table and being able yeah. to, to to make those those kind of uh, recommendations. Okay. Thank yeah. you so much, Valentina. And please, like as I, I said to you in the in the breakout room, come into the conversation later if um, if when we have the when we open up for for deliberation. Uh, but let's let's move on to our our, our uh, third speaker. Um, uh, who is uh, Gatain Ricard Naoul, who's a member of the Common Secretariat for the Conference on the Future of Europe. Gatain, welcome. Hello, hello everyone. It's good to, to have you with us. It's good to see you again. I think last time we we spoke, we were talking, it was during the, the Conference on the Future of Europe and we were, um, I had asked you about the future, we'd had this. So I'm going to ask you the same question again. Uh, but now we have the, the benefit of the conference having concluded. Um, and the question I had had asked was, you know, what are the possibilities of making the conference permanent? Because we've all this experience has been built up. The kind of the the you know this huge exercise has been done, and it seems a shame to kind of dissolve that and and not build upon it. It feels like there's a there's a momentum for getting citizens really involved in the in the policy making process and having their voice represented. So the question I have for you then is is what must be done? Do you think to maintain the momentum, calling for a new inclusive and, and deliberative model of democratic participation, and can such a model be permanently adopted at the EU level? Well, first of all, I think it's important to, to remind that, you know, there was some skepticism when we started on this. There was some skepticism about, will this work at the transnational level? We had some experience at the national regional level. Uh, would this work that the citizens are so much at the center of the process? Um, and we have to be happy now that because this is the first important step, we have shown that it works, that it works in 24 languages that it works at transnational level, random selection, a citizen assembly. Um, and uh, of course that it works also that uh, we put the citizens at the center of a process. And I think it, it's important that Valentina was reminding that the panels were extremely important, but then the citizen component in the Finland was also something very innovative, completely unprecedented. The panels, we had some tiny experience at European level, but the plenary was something unprecedented. And we did not believe that the citizens would take the power so much, you know, in this process. And I think it was very interesting and an innovation that that worked. And that's the first thing I think we need to, to, to stop and think about. We are in an important phase now. And I think it's important when you say the conference is over, I, I tend to say a first phase is over. Now we are entering another one, which is the follow up and the feedback. And I think if we want these deliberative and participatory processes to work and to stay, as you as you suggest, we need to uh, make sure that we can do this second phase as well. And this is why it's important that we have this feedback event in the autumn, that we will see the citizens again, we will speak to them, we will give feedback on what happened. And I think it's important when we talk about these processes that we see really the phase where we do the proposal and the phase where we, we follow up and, and, uh, and give feedback. Um, so all this, this innovation, I think, brought something that is quite important uh, in the EU institutions. It's a culture change, I think. Um, I think it's Give uh, Rochette who is now saying, you know, I was skeptical at the beginning, but now I really, truly believe that the EU can only work with the two legs, which is the representative democracy on the one hand and participatory and deliberative democracy on the other end. And I think this is quite important if we at least have this common vision about what can be uh, the future of, uh, of EU democracy. And third, uh, you probably have seen that uh, the President von der Leyen uh, proposed that the panels are kept uh, in, the, in the framework of how we do policies uh, at EU level. She proposed that we continue using panels to prepare key legislative proposals. So there is already a first reflection and a first step 
uh, to see how we can embed this more in the way we do policy making and we do better policy making by involving uh, citizens more directly uh, in the process. So now, of course, uh, we are opening this follow up phase, so each institution will have to give their uh, opinion on this. Uh, they will all uh, take, as you know, uh, a step, they will uh, say something, and then hopefully in the feedback event, we will be able to do a first synthesis of that and, and give feedback uh, to the citizens. So I can't give you a full sketch of how this deliberative democracy will be embedded in the process right now, but I can see the culture change and I can see the first seeds being there and that are very promising. Okay, and I think for me, I think this is going to be a critical question because the, the, the criticism that you could hear is that, you know, it's a talking shop, that there's no genuine kind of power role for the for citizens. It's just kind of uh, what's sometimes called democracy washing. Um, and this is the, 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 the kind of the, the way, you know, the proof is in the pudding, the way that it's integrated, I think is going to be key. So, um, how should it be integrated? I hope some of you watching maybe have some ideas um, or other questions or remarks. Let's open it up to, uh, to kind of some, some debate. Um, again, if you have questions, please kind of raise your, your hand, uh, your kind of virtual hand, and um, I will give you the floor. You can ask to any of the, the, the panelists. If not, I'm happy to to kind of ask my questions, but uh, I, I know that a lot of you are working in deliberative and, and participatory democracy, so I hope that we see some questions coming in. I can see some hands going up. Julius, if you can, uh, I'll, I'll give way to you, if you can introduce yourself and then ask your, your question to the panel. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Julius, as you can read. Uh, I've kind of got various hats. I'm um, working with, with Pulse of Europe, uh, with the Home Parliament, um, I'm a Climate Pact Ambassador, I also work with the European Commission for the Climate Pact, which is also about citizen engagement, um, and I'm very active in the Young European Federalists, which um, at least the people from the Brussels bubble uh, will know, um, and I'm leading the, the UK section of that organisation. Um, and my question, um, I don't know who to direct it to, to be honest, um, but having worked in, in public administration myself and organised um, citizen engaging processes, um, I know that uh, at some point, um, ideas and proposals get lost. Um, and at some point there will be this gap between what was discussed in the conference, which is really progressive and which is amazing from a European Federalist perspective, um, the, the gap between that and what will be implemented uh, politically. And I'm kind of interested in um, where this gap is exactly and how it can be uh, combated. Um, so if, for example, with regards to the setup of the conference, um, which I know I think we have some people here that were working on that themselves. Um, maybe that would be interesting to know um, how free was 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 the was the facilitators and the moderations hand in leading those discussions, for example. That would be interesting for me. Um, or for example, with regards to the, um, the the summarizations or the presentations in the parliament. I know having moderated um, the European Youth Conference, for example, that um, the space that is given for direct exchange with political leaders is always very short. And then yes, you can put it into, into a report, but who is gonna read the report and so on and so forth. So there are various sort of operational, um, really hands-on issues um, that are sometimes preventing that translation from the nice debate that is happening to real life politics. So where, where are those gaps and how can they be closed? I don't know who to ask. It's a complicated. That's an excellent question. I, to be honest, I think that would be interesting to hear kind of all the different perspectives for, uh, from the, the panel today. Um, I'm, I've got another hand up, and then maybe I'll, I'll take these two questions to the to the panel. Inga, if you want to introduce yourself and then ask your your question. Sure. Thanks. Uh, so I'm Inga Breeze. I'm director of policy and advocacy at the European Youth Forum. Um, my question would be to the panelists and. Um, whoever wants to respond really, is what do you see as the role for organized civil society, so civil society organizations, as opposed to individual citizens in this form of direct democracy that was tested with the Conference on the Future of Europe? Because I, this is something that um, we've been struggling with as, as organized civil society organizations, whereby we had uh, eight representatives in these hundreds of people that were there. 
Um, and the difference obviously between individual citizens and, and representatives of civil society organizations is that citizens represent themselves and civil society organizations re represent a group of people, sometimes a really big group. So in our case, it's about 14 million uh, young people. Um, and with civil society organizations who also follow certain policies in, in very much detail and are also sometimes more critical than um, individual citizens and, and are, can be stronger in holding um, politicians to account. So what do you see as the role of organized civil society versus random citizens in this direct form of democracy? Thank you. That is an excellent question. And I often hear a criticism of deliberative processes is that they can be kind of atomizing and that um, they lose that, that kind of collective element of, of European politics that is obviously a big part of, 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 of our politics. So that's, I think, a really excellent question. What's the role of civil society? Um, I've got one more question, Borak. I'm going to kind of group all these together. Borak, if you want to ask your question, and then I'll go down the panel and get the responses. Uh, thank you very much for organizing this very important uh, event. Actually, I have just brief two questions. Uh, so number one is, how do you see the role of cities in, in, in European continent? Because uh, we have different cities in the north and the south who have different experiences in dealing with uh, uh, different problems such as migration, climate change, extremism, etc. So how can cities be embedded in the dialogue? And the second question is, how do you see the role of cultural diversity in the European continent? And as someone who worked in the European Parliament, I can say that the European demography is not necessarily reflected in the EU institutions. And I think there is a lot of energy out there, outside Brussels, and it should be also brought into the center of decision making. So I, I'm just interested to know what the panelists are thinking, or are there any concrete uh, steps to include those two topics? Thank you. Okay, fantastic. Let's start with uh, Alberto then. So the first question is from Julius. Alberto asks, you know, he says ideas and proposals get lost. There will be a gap between uh, what is discussed and then what is in enacted. How do you kind of identify and, and close those gaps? And I think this is really interesting, Alberto, building on your opening statement about how, you know, not all of the ideas may be adopted. Some of them are out there, they will remain out there. But the question is, does that create a gap um, where the kind of the discussions and the political reality don't, don't kind of match and ideas get kind of lost in, in that gap and don't get returned to. The second question from Inga about what's the role for civil society, uh, organized civil society, and then the question from Borak to what about the role of cities? Um, and then also this sense of kind of cultural diversity in, in the European continent, how can you ensure that is, is included? So, you know, I don't know if you, how you want to respond to those, but um, uh, I'll just kind of give you the floor and you can kind of, uh, you know, um, give us your, your thoughts on those. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, great, great questions. I won't be able to tackle all of them, but I will do my best uh, in addressing the, the first one, uh, Julius, regarding gaps. Uh, certainly, there's no need to highlight the fact that the conference has been a unique experience, something new, something novel. That also means that uh, it has engendered very different expectations. So how to identify gaps? when very different expectations were formulated, basically each institution, each political party, each citizens who was aware of the conference has developed his own expectation. I would rather uh, flip the question by saying that the conference itself has actually addressed the big gap, the gap that the EU institutions never managed to fill up, which is the following. The idea of participation and relying on participation as a important element to gain and to give some legitimacy to European action has been with us for at least 20 years, right? Since uh, the white paper on governance in the year 2000, uh, we push for citizens to show up more and more. And we all know that the participatory idea is great in theory, but it's very bad in practice. When you look at the reality of the citizens who take the time to take, the, to take part of a consultation, to file a petition, well, those people are the usual suspects, are very few organized individuals, perhaps organized civil society organizations, which struggle to be representative of civil society in Europe. But this is exactly the point that the Conference on the Future of Europe managed to overcome. Why? Because it relied on sortition. And by relying on sortition, by default, it managed to bring into the European conversation citizens who would have never been uh, devoting not even a minute of their time to the subject that are the center of the European conversation. 
So and, you know, and I'm way, sure everyone. I'm sure everyone knows, but just to quickly define sortition for for everyone, random selection. Yes, yeah, citizens who were involved in the citizens panel were citizens who have been uh, randomly selected. That basically means that the methodology employed tried to maximize the diversity, the socioeconomic, demographic diversity of those individuals. And depending on the granularity of the methodology you take, you can actually create a sort of microcosm of society being brought together. And this is something many of us experience being there as observer, as experts. For the first time, we felt that the citizens engaging on Europe and discussing about major European issues were very close to those people who animate our Christmas dinners, right? It could have been our aunts, it could have been our cousins. Many young people were represented. Most of them didn't have a common language. And therefore, this really reflected more than usual uh, what happened out there. And this is exactly the gap that I think the conference and hopefully uh, a deliberative infrastructure that the European Union might develop in the future months and years will be able to address. And this will give a new meaning uh, to participation. What does it mean to participate in Europe? It's not only about giving the chance to those who already have an opportunity because of education, because of their socioeconomics, to take the time to contribute to the European conversation, but actually creating, if you want, quite artificially the conditions to allow everybody in a proactive way to have a say on Europe. And when you do so, the citizens show interest, commitment, uh, and even some enthusiasm, as we just heard earlier on from the participants, to actually be part of that conversation. And this is the quality, uh, I would say, uh, change that we're gonna be witnessing uh, in the coming months, how can we structurally address this issue of the citizens gap? How we can turn citizens into a permanent feature in the day-to-day -day decision making? And how can we link uh, the um, existence of participatory channels from petitions to consultations to a deliberative chamber? Uh, meaning uh, a set of procedures and mechanisms that allow those citizens to actually feed uh, also with uh, citizens who are out there and they might have some issues with the European Union. This is really the game changer that it might occur and on which we should spend much more time thinking and experimenting. This is, for me, I mean, the. Um, I think these, these are excellent questions and I think I've, I've mentioned before, everyone should check out the, this report by the OECD on institutionalizing the deliberative wave, which set, I'm sure one of my colleagues can put it into the, into the chat, which sets out some of the ways that you might link deliberative processes to um, uh, re existing representative uh, democratic institutions, such as parliamentary um, committees uh, or, or some of the participatory tools that, that Alberto Alamano was talking about, such as petitions and, and, and so on. I think this is really, really interesting stuff. And also the reason why people working in this space get so excited um, by the, 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 the Conference on the Future of Europe is indeed this sortition word this kind of um this random selection uh, and and you know citizens assemblies are sometimes called mini publics because they uh, do indeed you know through sortition through random selection they are supposed to in theory kind of represent uh, a kind of public in miniature is the is the idea behind it um valentina let's uh, let's bring you in i want to ask you this question of gaps um because i want to ask you from the perspective of a participant who took part in this did you feel there were in the process did you feel there were ideas which came out of the discussion that you had in your panel which weren't included or that fell through the gaps or have you seen since the you know is there a fear that that some of the discussion won't be captured or will kind of fall through these 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 gaps that we've been talking about is that a, a concern you have oh yes for sure we had a lot of concern about in maybe losing uh, all the recommendation elements when we when we were working on proposals and uh, but i think all uh, citizens involved in the working groups uh, and even in all panels did a good job keeping an eye both on each panel recommendation and uh, even others panels as well i mean helping each other to not to lose uh, i mean uh, uh, recommendation coming from european citizen panel but also from national citizen panel and uh, caring about also the digital platform because um, many of us were worried about uh, all contribution from uh, the digital platform that may be lost uh, or maybe not fully included in uh, proposals yes there was a big fear maybe also being uh, 
I mean, manipulated of our request to be turned into something different from what we want at the beginning. Yes. Well, that's that's interesting. That's <laughs> almost the, the kind of flip side because there's a, a, a fear about ideas falling into the gaps, but there's also maybe a related fear of ideas coming out of nowhere, which don't, you know, somehow, or ideas being misconstrued or, or changed. And this is also a fear that, that you, you have. Okay, interesting. Okay, look, we're gonna, um, I want to bring in uh, Gatain here, particularly, I wanna ask you, Gatain, about the, um, this, the questions from Inga and Burak about, you know, the role of organized civil society and, and the role of, of kind of cities and then diversity, of course, you know, this, this question of how do, you, how do you have that diversity reflected? Could you speak to that a little bit, your, your own kind of thoughts on, on, on those, uh, those kind of factors? Yes, uh, I think these were really good questions and, and I really wanted to, to respond on the organized civil society question. Well, first of all, to say that the European News Forum was very well treated in the plenary because the president was member of the citizens component and a chair of a working group, as you know, so uh, they, had, they had a big space. But in general, uh, and I think it's important to say we are not opposing forms of democracy here, uh, direct against participatory or something like that, organize and random selection. I think it would be a, a strong mistake a very to, to oppose these things, you know, on the one hand, organized civil society, on the other hand, randomly selected people uh, in, in citizens' panels. Uh, we need all of this, you know, we need all of this to have a very vibrant democracy. Uh, we cannot rely only on organizing the society and we cannot rely only on randomly selected uh, assemblies, but we need, and, and I agree with, with Inger, there is the need of a reflection to see how we can create the best synergies possible between these two processes of participation, because at the end it's a process of participation in democracy either through an organized civil society or through a citizen assembly. And we should really not oppose these two. And on diversity, uh, I, I, I cannot agree more. I think uh, one of the major um, uh, takeaway uh, that I have from this experience of the conference, I knew it, but it reinforces the conviction that diversity is key for democracy to function properly. Uh, and random selection, everyone said it, Alberto, um, you, you said it clearly as well. The sortition brought something new with this because we are, we managed to include people indeed who are not part of that diversity yet. Um, we can improve, we can do it better, we, uh, we can be more inclusive, of course, and, and we will we'll strive to be more inclusive. But I think we really need to acknowledge that this random selection has brought something interesting in reinforcing the range of diversity that we can have uh, in the EU. And so I think it's a big step indeed that we're taken by these panels and that we should keep. Perfect. Okay, let's bring in uh, the three three more speakers who uh, can kind of comment on the discussion so far. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring in Calypso Nicolaitis, who's uh, a, a, a professorial chair of global affairs, European University Institute School of Transnational uh, Governance. Uh, welcome, Calypso. Thank you for having me, friends of Europe. It's been a long time, uh, but it's a, you're a wonderful organization and forums. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you. Thank you so much for the kind words. It's also a pleasure to, to have you with us. Um, and you've been following the conference very closely. And I, you moderated a, a panel at the beginning of the of the conference where you were asking, you know, should we have a permanent conference? How are we, you were asking these questions well ahead of, of, of everyone else. I think it's um, so. So I'd, I'd be interested to hear your perspective uh, on, on what we've been discussing today, particularly how do we kind of find those those synergies between um, so deliberative democracy doesn't seem to be in, in kind of competition with other forms of democracy, but is complementing them and then genuinely is giving citizens uh, a voice and you're not having kind of ideas falling through gaps and so on. So it's it's very frustrating. What are your thoughts on, on some of the kind of the, the things that have been uh, said here today so far? And particularly, how do we kind of institutionalize this? How do we make these processes um, permanent and uh, and meaningful? Um, I, I agree with uh, most of what has been said with, by my friends, Alberto and, and, and Gaetan and Valentina. I think we are a bit of an ecosystem ourselves of having had a passion for this process, for the fact that it's an experiment 
with its flaws, but an experiment that has been fascinating and that it is very promising, even if today we are only seeing the beginning. So we are only at the beginning is, is the first point. Second one, Joe, in, in answer to your question, because you, you would like us to focus now and in, in the company, including of Max, who um, himself was a citizen uh, and with whom we have worked, you know, he was in Kofi. So we're all concerned with the fact that the citizens all went through this experience, including those who were tasked to think about democracy, but also in the other assemblies. And they concluded that they were themselves happy guinea pigs, if I can put it that way. They concluded that, hey, what we've been doing for months and sacrificing many weekends where we could have been at home, we want this to become the modus vivendi of the EU. Now, you asked Joe what it would take, because so this is an important recommendation out of the 178, which Alberto you know, was talking about. Um, and what it would take, I think, is three ingredients. One is a, a like a play, if you want, a story, a set, and actors. The story is very much what, what we've, you've just been talking about. Um, and Gaetan couldn't be more right in saying we have to walk with two legs. The democracy we know, representative democracy, can be supplemented by deliberative democracy. But I think we need to be conscious that these things are contested. This is not such a straightforward story. We think that, Gaetan thinks that, but a lot of um, traditional representatives and politicians out there may not say it explicitly on a Zoom call like this one, but think, well, you know, these randomly selected citizens, who are they? They represent only themselves, and even Inga said that in, in a certain way. And I completely agree with Inga that civil society and organized civil society needs, including a statue, needs a voice because they represent another you know, a, a force in democracy. But we need to tell that story that randomness is democracy, that if each one of these citizens can be anyone, they just look like you and me, they're sitting in the European parliament, wow, they dress normally, they speak normally, that's interesting. That means that collectively they can be everyone. It's this microcosmos, mini public you were talking about. Now that story, Joe, is only beginning to percolate in the collective consciousness of Europeans. So we need to tell it with passion because it's not familiar. And there are citizens who care, for instance, very much about direct democracy, referenda. They could be afraid that, well, this will supplant it. So we also have to protect when we tell that story, the idea that these citizens assembly will have consequences, they will lead to something, and they can even lead to referenda, like in Ireland, when they led to a referenda on abortion or on same-sex marriage. Wow, that's a very big consequence. So this is a big story we need to tell again and again. But secondly, and much faster, a set. That is, you we, we cannot just want a citizens assembly sitting there in Strasbourg, you know, meeting once every four months or years. Um, we need a whole democratic atmospherics in Europe, a democratic ecology that reflects the fact that the story is about representing means something very different today. So everyone, as many people as possible, should be connected to this. This is what Burak's very important question about cities and region. Let's hope this such an assembly is part of a network of assemblies. It itself is rotating and visiting cities. It's part of a patchwork, a mosaic of initiatives. And when it connects to actual policy making, it's deliberation, but it's also part of decision making. And it's involved in future foresight because citizens are very, very good at thinking about the future. And that leads me to my third ingredient, Joe, the actors, we're talking about a play, we're talking about a democratic play, right? And so this is about citizens, yes. It's about the fact that as, as it was said earlier, you know, people don't always have the time. They're very intermittent, like you are intermittent, most of us on this call. We have other things, we other jobs. Um, but if you put all of the citizens together in what I call a democratic panopticon, they become permanent, a permanent democratic gaze and involvement in the policymaking process as a collective intelligence. But that permanence is conditional on making a difference. And this is where the mindset of institutional actors, of politicians and policymakers really matters. 
because they have to be ready not only to listen, but respect, take into account, etc. And I would say not everybody is Gaitan in this world. Um, there are many politicians who are not quite there yet, but that's why it's an adventure and a journey. Wonderful. No, I, I, I would agree with, with all of that. I think um, randomness is democracy. I think that's a fantastic uh, catchphrase. And also the, the idea that, um, you know, it, there is a, an element of kind of meaning making, you know, what, what is democracy to us? What does it mean? And if, if we kind of normalize this deliberative process, if we say this is what democracy is, if it becomes at local, at national, at the European level, how democracy works, I think that is such a valuable uh, kind of uh, approach. And it, and it you know, goes back to what um, uh, Alberto was talking about in terms of, you know, these ideas are out there and they stay out there and they're introduced. And if there's a kind of a, a voice or a way for them to be discussed, that in itself is, is moving the, the conversation on. So that's, that's really interesting. Uh, you also pointed out that we are in an ecosystem here and you know, that's, that's clearly the case. We're all, myself included, very much cheerleaders for this this process but let's bring in a voice from outside the the ecosystem perhaps uh, i want to bring in uh thomas uh Rekos, who's ceo and co-founder of the participation factory and he's very very involved in participatory processes in, in deliberative democracy but at, but not in the eu not in the kind of brussels bubble so he's working in czechia um and he's kind of working at the the national and, and local level so i think you know I'd, I'd be very interested to hear thomas what you make of this conversation this 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 discussion what are your kind of thoughts on on the the, the conversation so far um, hi everyone, thank you for having me. Um, as said, um, my expertise is very practical, hands on. Uh, with my team, we basically on daily basis work on participatory processes of all kinds. And um, hearing this discussion, first of all, I think you should uh, you should have organized two of these events, uh, not just one, because one should be really on uh, to uh, you know evaluate what's up with the process how we're going to continue let's talk technical you know evaluation outcomes and let's make it better next time and let's move on and the second discussion should be about uh, what's happening with the other processes because uh, you know this is just one and uh, the feeling from the outside especially from um, the kind of point of view of a implementer is that if the question is what's the future um, it should be about there's so much work to do and there's so many methods and so many approaches how to engage citizens it works beautifully on local and regional level it's getting more and more upwards it's basically just two floors down you know on the regional level across the europe there are so many exciting things happening and uh what is what is, what is uh, up there only national state level and then e level so i, I believe it's coming and from my perspective, uh, there are basically two types of participatory processes. Ones are the first one, the category is what the coffee was about. It's about piloting, um, you know, trying uh, new unique ways, uh, trying something for the first time. And it's always wrapped about skepticism. It's wrapped with, uh, um, you know, a lot of stress and, uh, you know, new experiences. Uh, and for me, um, and I experienced uh, uh, the conference in Dublin, especially, uh, for me, it was uh, extremely interesting, but from a process point of view, uh, from like a technical point of view, when you really look on a participation as, as a process, it's, it's quite an engineering, really. Uh, it wasn't that unique. What was unique was the uh, spotlight, you know, was the stress, was the narrative, was the context of that. That was absolutely unique. And I think that uh, it was a huge success, to be honest, you know, like, all the problems that are being discussed from a process design point of view are um, easy to correct, easy to make better. And I mean, you know, let's move on. Let's, let's do it again. The second part, uh, the second type of participatory processes are those that are not that unique anymore. They're basically being considered to be a standard. You know, they, they, they might not be that exciting. But I think they are even more important because uh, these, what, what is the success of participation? Uh, that it's not being uh, really taken as anything exceptional, but it's being part of everyday life. And this is where EU should be, I believe, uh, kind of heading forward to. And I think that the second panel, maybe next time, if there is going to be one, should be really about what are the other agendas and projects. Uh, 
cross-regional cooperation, um, you know, um, finding specific target group uh, that can be consulted on uh, different type of uh, um, agendas like uh, social affairs, transportation, you name it. There is a lot of cross-EU topics, obviously, that uh, citizens should be engaged with. And this is something a little bit different. So from my point of view, it was a great success. You know what? That is that hearing you speak um, really does fill me with with kind of excitement. It's, it's wonderful to hear that you didn't find the process that unique. That it's happening. You know, these participatory and deliberative processes are happening at the local and the national level, ir irrespective of what's happening at the EU level. So to me, it says, okay, let's. How do you join those up? How do you kind of tap in? You know, like how do you make? It's, it's this question of synergies and how to connect processes um because uh it's already happening it's not like you know this is this unique experiment that it's maybe the level of politics is interesting but the you know this this really is a, a kind of deliberative wave which is which is very exciting and then goes some way towards what um uh, calypso nicolaitis was saying about okay kind of you know normalizing it or how do we see this how do we kind of understand what, what what is happening do we understand it as democracy is this just how democracy should should work that's interesting let's bring in okay last speaker let's bring in max um Steyer, who's a citizen we'll give the kind of the, and then we'll have a a round of final questions before we close um but max uh again you were a, a participant of the conference on the future of europe so you've you've kind of seen this from the inside the the process um and uh again you're in panel two on european democracy values and rights and rule of law and security um what are your thoughts on what's been been said today the discussion that that has been had and and perhaps a little bit about you know particularly the the future and what you hope comes out of the of the um of the conference and what kind of what next steps are, are, are taken what are your thoughts Thank you, Joe, and uh, it's a privilege to be here and uh, hear this a stellar set of remarks and uh, questions um, so far. Um, and I would just add that uh, I, I think it's um, very uh, good um, to capture um, this experience uh, from my personal perspective uh, through the terms of honor, obligation uh, and inspiration. Um, and the first two of these terms uh, have been mentioned, I think, by, by Gaetan in one of her earlier writings on participatory uh, democracy, that the transnational citizen participation uh, really is a source of, of honor because it's a huge opportunity uh, for those few randomly selected uh, participants to have their voices heard, which is what also Valentina uh, has been mentioning uh, before. And it is also a source of obligation because even though uh, I agree with the point of, of Thomas Rakos that uh, this uh, process may not be unique in all regards, um, certainly the stakes are high in terms of how this process will be evaluated, will influence the perception uh, of uh, the viability of these deliberative instruments uh, in the future. Um, and also in the EU in, in particular. And the inspiration, because I think uh, that the citizens and particularly the ambassadors, so I, so I should clarify that I was a participant of one of these uh, ECPs, uh, but I was not an ambassador, unlike uh, Valentina. So she had a much more difficult uh, job in this sense. And particularly the ambassadors I've been, I've seen from uh, the recordings from the available materials have internalized uh, this idea of guarding uh, the recommendations. And democracy needs it, its guardians. And we usually uh, consider institutions to be the main guardians of democracy. But I think this experience shows that also the public and even randomly selected uh, members of the, of the public, uh, as we heard also from Calypso Nicolaitis, uh, can be guardians uh, of, of democracy. Now, in terms of the expectations, also I would uh, say just three uh, at this point. And, and first one is definitely what Valentina also mentioned, follow up uh, on the recommendations. But I would add that follow up in a way that also allows a response. Uh, from the members uh, of the ECP that also allows an organization uh, of these, uh, these panel members and the possibility to interact further with the institutions, to hold them uh, to account, not just to receive uh, some material uh, on, uh, the, on the feedback. Uh, the second one, uh, and this goes back perhaps to Alberto Alemano, uh, I think a constitutional convention, even though it might not result in an actual treaty change uh, might be useful uh, to really uh, keep this momentum, to keep this debate, and to also give some stakes 
uh, to this debate because my concern is uh, that without it, if uh, the consultative participatory processes will be the only one in place, uh, then uh, this will not really retain uh, these high stakes and this contagion. Uh, so opening a constitutional convention can open and, and retain uh, this debate perhaps with, with higher stakes. Uh, and, and finally, um, I would say, and this goes back to the civil society versus randomly selected citizens uh, question, I think alliances need to be formed and fostered between civil society and randomly selected citizens. Uh, and some of these have already been, been ongoing. Um, for instance, the Citizens Takeover Europe organization has been uh, very helpful uh, in helping um, the citizens also to organize, uh, uh, or some of them in the panel. And I think this is something that we could also discuss further in terms of how to do it, uh, but it's a very important uh, network and point of alliance uh, that could be fostered. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Max. Um, okay, there's some concrete re uh, recommendations there. And I love the idea of the process, you know, taking part in the in this deliberative process can kind of transform citizens into these kind of guardians. I, I like that. Who then, because I mean, with the question has come up at the beginning, what happens if ideas fall through the gaps? Well, if the citizens you know, suggested these ideas and if they are allowed, you know, the possibility to interact further and to kind of have feedback on any uh, any response from, from the institutions, then they can play that role potentially of a, of a guardian, making sure that ideas don't fall um, uh, into the into the gaps. That's a that's an interesting um, uh, kind of possibility. Um, look, we're almost out of time. I want to open up for another round of kind of questions and comments. I saw a couple of hands going up earlier, and this this also counts for any of the speakers who have already kind of made their remarks. If they want to come back in and respond to anything that is said, uh, please, now's the, the opportunity to do so. Um, uh, Joaquin, if you want to kind of kick us off and introduce Introduce yourself and, and ask your your question. We'll we'll kind of take a few together and then um, see who who would like to respond. Uh, so so Joaquin. Sure. Hello, I'm Joaquin. I'm a student uh, a student in Sciences Po, and I'm actually I'm currently doing a traineeship at the Council of the European Union. Uh, so I have two uh, quick questions, but first of all, I I wanted to thank you very much for organizing these uh, these event. And uh, also, I'm, I'm happy to, to realize that actually more people uh, value the, the importance of deliberative democracy. Uh, because I knew, for example, uh, Alberto, who is one of the most known figures, but now I see there are more people, hopefully. Uh, so the two quick questions I have, uh, the, the first one is about the cultural or political battle that uh, has to be vote in order to uh, have these deliberative or direct democracy. So do you think that in society we have already this cultural adherence or this uh, political willingness? Or perhaps does it come from, from our uh, political elites, for example, from the European Commission? Uh, yes, yeah, so the question is, do you think that society is ready or, or not? And the second one, is about uh, short-termism and, and long-term vision. Because sometimes we say that the problem of uh, our political elites is that they only want to win elections, so they have this short-term perspective. And to the citizens that have uh, participated to the panels, do you think these kind of exchanges, uh, this kind of experience uh, shows that we can actually have a long-term vision with uh, deliberative mechanisms? Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, these these questions, I think they speak um, somewhat to Calypso's point about, um, you know, I think she said not all politicians are as open to deliberative processes as Gatain, um, and and some of them may feel, uh, you know, who are these? Who are these citizens? Like, who do they represent? Um, and there may be a sense of kind of competition or threat. One of the things that stood out for me actually when I saw the the, the non paper which was circulated is that the process wasn't delegitimized. I think sortition gives the process legitimacy. And I think, you know, the, the, even though the non-paper was very careful to say, we listen to the citizens, we respect the process. That's in, in this era of, you know, uh, <laughs> you, you could imagine a kind of Trump style soundbite, which is like this whole thing is a, is a sham, it's illegitimate. And that didn't happen. There's a legitimacy, I think, in in uh, random selection. I think this is really interesting. I wonder if if others um, kind of uh, agree with me here. Uh, Julius, uh, what's your your question, and then we'll we'll put it to the panel. 
sorry, I had to find the mute button there. Um, I wanted to ask about the um, possibility of this ever reoccurring uh, concept of of year of multiple speeds because I, I I've seen the non paper. I found it disastrous. I, I really couldn't believe my eyes. Um, and I see that obviously there is a there is a conflict because not only with regards to treaty change but various other non treaty change changes uh, we we might need um, a unanimity um, and that means that we have to have everyone on board which is going to boil us down to this European smallest common denominator smallest common compromise um, and I wanted to ask if that was discussed at all during the conference um, this possibility of of certain states that want to go further in this process of becoming a federation um, and that, that those countries would, would work together and that other countries would maybe um, reserve more rights uh, for themselves and more, more autonomy in, in other areas. Um, and maybe from an intellectual academic perspective, uh, also to hear from, 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 from that perspective, how, 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 that would, how that would play out and how that would maybe enable the testing of certain proposals that, that were proposed by the citizens that are maybe not liked by all the heads of states and government, but that maybe uh, work and that will maybe lead to other countries joining that Europe of faster velocity, if you like, uh, in 10 or 20 years time. And this is, this is um, of course, it's, it's kind of maybe drawing a page from the vision that Emmanuel Macron, the, the French president, has in terms of kind of circles of, of integration, uh, perhaps using kind of enhanced cooperation, some member states could could adopt some of the proposals and go further, uh, and then maybe later be joined by by others. That's a, that's that's one possible uh, kind of approach. Very interesting. Uh, for, so, for my panelists, who would like to kind of come back? Um, if you want to kind of raise your hands, I think there's a lot. So again, uh, Joaquin asked, um, "What about this? You know, basically, is society ready? Do pol are politicians kind of kind of accept?" The, the, the this new um uh you know deliberative approach or are they going to be threatened by it and and uh, and be quite close to it uh, do we think um and and this question of kind of short termism and, and long term vision um will this kind of experience maybe encourage more long term thinking and then julius's question about the kind of multi speed europe and whether that could be a way around to sidestep the the treaty change kind of trap which alamano was uh, alberto alamano was was outlining at the beginning do any of my panelists want to to come in on that otherwise i'll i will pick on a couple as we just start to yeah alberto please yeah, very briefly, just building on what uh, Joaquin correctly pointed out when he said that historically the European Union has been uh, quite reluctant in paying attention to the expression of popular sovereignty. That's why the European Union exists, right, to offer a sort of constraint of a limit uh, in the say after the Second World War to the expression of popular will and, you know, even electoral majority that might take uh, and hijack uh, the very same institution. That basically means that there is still today a, a deeply embedded anti-popular bias in the way in which our European archite institutional architecture and decision making can be embedded. But this is changing and this is changing because our political class, our political leaders, probably more out of prag pragmatism than out of ideological conviction, they realize that they need to be much more responsive and need to be much more uh, reliant and ready to absorb what citizens' preferences exist and how they change between one electoral moment to, to another. So the space in between elections is a space that has to be filled up and they need to be uh, ready uh, to uh, somehow uh, identify, detect those changes. And the union, the EU is no exception. Uh, this happens uh, virtually in all uh, democratic uh, systems. On uh, Julius uh, demand, I would like to nuance a little bit this dichotomy between uh, countries being pro-treaty change and those who are against. Uh, what happened to me over the last couple of weeks has been to meet leaders, political leaders who are in principle and on paper against it, against treaty reform, but might be open uh, for certain specific issues to engage uh, into a process that might lead uh, to some treaty changes, and also to meet some uh, representatives of big countries who are on paper very much in favor. I'm talking about Germany, about France, about Italy, about Spain, but then off the record, they tell you, well, I don't think it's a great idea to reopen the treaty. So we are kind of expected to say we are open uh, to do that. So very important to nuance a little bit the current conversation 
uh, between the pro and the contra and to see that perhaps there is a gray area, which is the one where most of the countries situate themselves on, that seems to be open uh, to think about alternative procedures that might lead to translate some of these recommendations into action. And probably the most important one being represented by this idea of embedding uh, these citizens' panels in the day-to-day decision-making of the EU. Thank you, Alberto. And indeed, that is certainly my kind of uh, reading as well. It feels like a lot of member states, uh, big and small, whatever they're saying, are kind of keeping their powder dry on the on the treaty question. I, I feel like there's a, a kind of deep unease with the the status quo in, in general, but everyone has a different problem. <laughs> everyone is unhappy in a different way, which makes for a very kind of multidimensional and complicated negotiation potentially to try to find a, that kind of gray area that you talked about, uh, which of course could be where a lot of these gaps kind of open up where um, uh, some some ideas kind of fall outside of that. Um, okay, and um, final thoughts, um, Calypso? Well, I would, I, Joe, you said everyone has a different problem, but many of mainstream politicians, they think their problem is populism. Now, it is true that a certain kind of populism asks people to trust in a great leader that is against the elites. The, what we are talking about, deliberative democracy, is a kind of, in a way, a populism or a peopleism that is pluralist. It, the idea is we're going to be many, we're going to be multitudes, and we're going to talk to each other across borders in a consequential way. So call it pluralist populism, if you will, because Joachim's question is, you know, is, is society ready? Joachim, you have siblings, friends, you know, you know, lots of you, you look young. <laughs> it's, it's hard to say on Zoom. But you know, I mean, what would you say you're of course, it's not everyone people have different interests, etc. But from time to time, most people want to be involved with stuff that concerns their everyday life. So I would say society is more than ready. But the question is, what are the opportunities? Um, and indeed, it all this cannot be just top down. There is a lot of mini jury and all that, that's kind of top down and that's great. That's institutions saying, we listen to you and we'll take into account what you say. But there's also long been for 20, 30 years, this whole OECD report, you know, talks about all, also these bottom up participatory budgeting, you know, um, neighborhoods. I mean, people just get together and do things. So the question in a way is how you can reconcile this top down and bottom up ethos one of the important type of actors we haven't talked about, and we should mention them, are the facilitators, all these organizations like Mission Publique and IFOC and others, who have indeed also um, made this, um, contributed to making the, the whole Conference on the Future of Europe a success, because it's not that easy to bring these different worlds together, which have very different culture. And that's what they've contributed to do. And I would add, Joachim, that you, you've, you ended your comment on the long term. And I think this is so important because actually politicians, for good and bad reasons, they care about their reelection. They're like the markets. They're short term is most of the time, even if they want to be long term, where citizens are concerned by their kids and their kids' children or, you know, the future. They want it to be fair. Fair transition is super important. And that's where we need to have the deliberative conversation about trade-offs. You know, who's going to pay, how, when, you know, what are we going to transfer? And this need to be owned. But as if it's owned by society, then it will happen this whole long term. And then, and that leads me to Julius's question, um, echoing also uh, Alberto, which is that indeed uh, President Macron talked about this and is so important that we are heading to, towards a Europe that will be even more differentiated in certain areas. We'll have clusters of integration. And if we need to go ahead on some of this, not with everybody, I think it would be too bad, but perhaps that in certain areas might be the, the best way. And it's also a way that kills two birds with one stone because it allows the Ukraines of this world as well as the Western Balkans to be real, Ten, tangible voices and presence in this reinvention of democracy that we're involved in. Thank you so much, Calypso. And um, uh, just to, to kind of add to that, you know, one of my great hopes is that deliberative processes can kind of 
by bringing people together by having this kind of pluralist populism that that, that you were mentioning um, can break kind of political log jams can try to if, if 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 politics is stuck if 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 kind of there's a there's a you know entrenched views on either side then bring people together and have a conversation about it have a discussion and see if you can find uh, a way to kind of change the conversation so I, I think there's um, there's enormous value in that um, and also on participatory budgeting oh I would love to see that at the at the European level I think we're away 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 from that and, and public banks and all sorts of things that would be great but let's not scare the, the representative politicians too much uh, okay final I think we're, we're about ready to close up we've got about five minutes do any of my panelists want a final final word Katain or, or uh, Thomas or, or uh, Victoria or Max any kind of final thoughts before we close if not um, if everything's with Max please Yes, thanks. Uh, just uh, very briefly, maybe on this on this last point. So federation is not mentioned for a single time, I think, in the uh, report. Um, so it is not that the citizens were looking for some particular type of, of arrangement, but they, they were focusing on a holistic approach uh, to values. That means that uh, they've seen topics and issues as interconnected education, environmental protection, digital sovereignty, data protection, all these issues as, as connected. Uh, and so then the, the forms uh, of, of integration uh, depend on uh, basically the achievements that uh, can be reached by these forms of integration. Um, so I think that's the way how we could read perhaps also the, uh, the report. And therefore, there is also not much support, at least in my reading, uh, for um, these different speeds, at least as long uh, as they cannot contribute uh, to uh, this kind of holistic approach to values, the unification of values uh, in, in the EU. Perfect. Okay. I think it's fitting that we give the last word to, to Max, then a participant in the, in the conference in the future of Europe. Thank you, everybody, for, for tuning in. This was, I think, a fascinating conversation. Friends of Europe is really working on a lot of these questions under the rubric of something we're calling the, the new social contract, which is ideas about how do you reimagine democracy? How do you kind of regenerate democracy? So please, uh, we will be holding more events like this. We're going to continue this conversation. Um, I think Thomas pointed out that we should, you know, there's, there's there's two parts of this conversation. We talk about the, the conference and the follow-up, but there's also another part of the conversation which talks about, um, you know, where is where are existing processes not working? Where are they maybe falling down? And I think that's something that we, we, we need to kind of address and, and discuss. Um, thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of your day. I uh, hope you enjoyed yourselves. Um, and uh, please, um, I hope to see you in another uh, session uh, at Friends of Europe when we, we discuss this in future.